If you're dealing with gallbladder attacks, it can pretty much be one of the worst pains that a human can endure. And you really want to avoid that. Oh man, I really don't want that happening again. So a lot of people are, whether they're having gallbladder attacks or maybe they're just having gallbladder pains, like in that upper right quadrant, maybe after meals, they're having a lot of pain there. And they're either told to adapt a low fat diet or maybe they just figure out on their own, man, when I eat a lot of fat, that pain's a whole lot worse. But if I don't eat fat, Maybe it feels a little bit better. I'm staying away from the fat because that's pretty horrible. But I'm going to help you understand in this video how this can be a mistake and can actually make the gallbladder situation much worse. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So just remember, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice. I don't know your situation, so I couldn't possibly know what's right for you. But if your doctor is telling you to use a low-fat diet, then I want you to listen to your doctor. I just want to share some studies, and I'll put those links in the description below this video and some information that I found that might help us understand that this can really magnify some problems, especially down the road. So to understand why we might deal with gallstones or have some type of pain, in the gallbladder, we need to understand bile function. So bile is this soapy substance that's made in the liver and then it comes down here through this biliary pathway and it gets stored in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder's job is to concentrate that bile so that a small amount of that bile can be more effective and more helpful to come down here when this acidified food from the stomach leaves the stomach that's triggering this gallbladder to squirt the bile down. Oh man, where did my stomach go? This squirts down into this tube and then that helps neutralize the acids that leave the stomach. But that bile is also very important to help us emulsify or break down our dietary fats. If we can't break down dietary fats correctly, we can't access fat soluble vitamins like A, E, D, and K, but also those fats can become rancid and toxic and become a problem for the body if they're not broken down correctly. So it's important for that bile to come down and it's also important for it to be concentrated in that gallbladder so that it can be more effective. And that's one of the reasons that when someone has lost their gallbladder, they can experience some digestive discomforts and digestive problems and less effective digestion. And this does not happen to everyone who has their gallbladder removed, but it does happen to a lot. And this is because this bile then is just kind of trickling down here a little bit at a time all the time. And that can create some trouble, but also the person is not getting a bolus of bile coming down when this acidified food leaves the stomach. So those are some pretty important tasks that the gallbladder has to take care of. Now here's what happens is sometimes we'll have gallstones form in this gallbladder and then if a stone comes up here and blocks one of these ducts or even one of these ducts down here, it can block anywhere there. But when a stone is blocking that duct or the bile can just become too sludgy to really move correctly and that can kind of block the flow as well. But when that happens, the body's still calling on the bile to come down there and it's still contracting that gallbladder and when the gallbladder can't move the bile through, it's creating crazy pain. It's like, oh wow, I didn't even know I knew those cuss words kind of pain. So that can be a problem that you want to avoid. And a lot of the confusion comes in when the medical world tells us, well, these stones are made out of cholesterol, so you're, you're eating too much cholesterol. You want to go on a low cholesterol diet and then you won't get gallstones. But there's a lot of evidence to show now that that's not really what's going on. There is cholesterol in the bile. That's an important aspect of bile. We really need that cholesterol for a lot of functions. But what happens is when this bile becomes too thick and sticky to really flow correctly, it might not flow as well. And there's a lot of things that can cause our bile to become too thick to flow correctly. Uh, high estrogen levels, whether somebody's taking a medication that's raising estrogen or some other situation is causing estrogen to go too high can thicken up this bile. Eating too many processed grains and junk food seems to have the ability to thicken up that bile. So there's a lot of things in our life 
that can cause this to become too thick and sticky to really flow correctly. And that's called cholestasis. And we hear a lot about that. And it's very popular now. All the cool kids have cholestasis. But what happens is when this bile gets stuck and it's not really flowing through the gallbladder correctly, well, remember the gallbladder's job is to concentrate that bile. And there's not an off switch for the concentration job that it's doing. So if it's not flowing, it will continue to concentrate more and more until it concentrates into sludge or even stones. So when we're looking at why these stones are coming about, sure, if a person had a whole lot more cholesterol, there might be more cholesterol in there to concentrate, but it's still the concentration action that has to happen for those stones to form. And to keep that from concentrating for too long, we need that flow to happen. We need the bile flowing through there correctly. So here's what's important to understand. When we eat our food and our stomachs make hydrochloric acid or HCL, that helps us acidify that food to break it down correctly. And a lot of people are going to tell you, well, it's cholecystokinin that triggers the gallbladder to contract and squirt that bile down there. But here's the thing, it's the acid in the stomach leaving the stomach that triggers the cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin can be triggered by either acids leaving the stomach and come down here into the duodenum, which is like the first 10 inches of the small intestine, or the cholecystokinin can be triggered by amino acids entering the duodenum or fatty acids entering the duodenum. So it's any of those things coming in here that can trigger this gallbladder like, oh, it's time to do my job. I gotta get some bile down there to help neutralize these acids or to help emulsify the dietary fats and really digest this food correctly. It's really important for us to digest the food correctly because that's how we get the nutrients out of the food that we're eating. That's why we're eating the food. So what I want to show you here is a study that I found on modified dietary fat intake for treatment of gallstone disease. And this was a meta-analysis of like five different studies. And when they're looking into this initially, the guys who wrote this study say, a preliminary review of the literature indicates that there is no published evidence of the benefits of low-fat diet compared with standard diet. However, with the increasing prevalence of obesity, there is evidence that people with obesity who were advised to follow weight-reducing diets that incorporate a very low-fat diet may be more likely to develop gallstones, and that diets higher in fat may reduce gallstone risks in adults losing weight. We do not anticipate that specific populations would experience different outcomes from this intervention. So when they're putting this study together, like, well, here's kind of what goes on and we already know this. So we have a feeling that this is going to be the situation. And they go on to say, as dietary fat is a potent stimulator of gallbladder contraction, dietary fat may provoke or exacerbate postprandial pain. So what they're saying is that, well, this dietary fat can really trigger the gallbladder to go into action. So postprandial, after you eat pain, can really get magnified if a person has some type of stone or some type of blockage that's keeping things from flowing there correctly. So this is why we hear this advice so often is that, wow, you don't want to have pain? Okay, just don't eat a lot of fat in your diet and you're not going to have pain. But they go on to say, however, the gallbladder also contracts spontaneously and in response to an intake of mixed meals, protein, or cephalic stimulation. So they're saying that, yeah, that it doesn't just have to be dietary fat that's going to trigger this pain. It can also be protein or amino acids coming in there. And they say, furthermore, if restricting dietary fat does lead to a reduction in gallbladder contractions and emptying, it may also increase the risk of gallstone deposition, as a lithogenic bile would be retained longer in the gallbladder, thus potentially exacerbating the problems. So sort of like we were just talking about it, this lithogenic bile is bile that seems to have more concentrates in it, is kind of what they're saying. And the reason there's more things that are concentrated in it because the bile is more concentrated. So just like you would cook a gravy on the stove, the longer you cook it there, the more of those liquids leave that gravy. And gravy is delicious, but it becomes more thick when more water leaves, the more it concentrates. So same thing in this gallbladder. The longer it concentrates, the more of those liquids are taking out and the thicker it becomes.
And their conclusion from this study was that there really wasn't any difference between the people who lowered their fat and the people who didn't when it came to actually creating improvement to that gallstone or gallbladder problem. And other studies that I found were looking at factors like whether they went to college or whether they had a job and that would dictate how their gallbladder functions would improve or not. So this is the one that seemed to have the most sense to it, but they found that there really didn't seem to improvement when someone was trying to improve the situation, whether they were reducing fat or not. And that makes sense since there's other aspects that can stimulate that gallbladder to be into action. And since reducing that stimulation at all can have the ability to make things worse for some folks. So, and this is just my opinion, but the reason that the, the higher fat triggers symptoms for more people is that it's my opinion that a lot of times this bile has become too thick and sticky to flow correctly because the person isn't making enough stomach acid. It's very common for someone not to make enough stomach acid for a wide variety of reasons. Millions of people are turning off their stomach acid on a daily basis, on purpose. But even if someone is not taking a medication to turn off stomach acid, there's lots of reasons that a person would not be able to make enough stomach acid. So if this food is not being acidified correctly, then there, it's not breaking down into amino acids. We need a stomach acid there to break proteins down into amino acids. So then there's not really amino acids coming down here to trigger the gallbladder. And also, there's not enough stomach acid to come down here to trigger the gallbladder to flow. Remember, that acid is what triggers that cholecystokinin to tell the gallbladder to contract. So if someone doesn't have enough stomach acid, they're really set up to reduce the activity of the gallbladder, less flowing through the gallbladder, which means more concentration, more likely to create these stones and have the problems in the first place. So then here's this individual, doesn't have a lot of stomach acid, bile is not flowing, maybe some stones are blocking the duct, maybe it's just sludge that blocks the duct. But they're, when they're eating protein or some other type of carbohydrate food or something, they're not really triggering the gallbladder so they don't have pain. But when they eat fats, then they're triggering the gallbladder and that's when they get the pain. Does that make sense? So I think that's very common and that's why we see so much people saying, ah, go on a low fat diet and you won't get any pain. Now, look at this scenario though. If a person is just kind of waiting a few days till they're having their gallbladder removal surgery, maybe this is the right thing to do just to avoid another gallbladder attack while they're waiting in line. Now that's not me telling you to have your gallbladder removed. I'm not a doctor, that's not my job. Some people really need their gallbladder removed. It can be gangrene, there can be infections, there can be a stone the side of you know, a blimp in their gallbladder or something. But we hear from people on a daily basis in the comments of our videos who really wish they had been told other options when it came to removing their gallbladder. They wish that they would have had an opportunity to take other steps to save their gallbladder. So that's a popular opinion that we hear. But if someone's just waiting for surgery, then this is a great way to avoid an attack, is to keep this from being activated and then giving that contraction and not being able to move to create all that pressure that creates the pain. Here's another thing to think about too. If a person has stones, and if you look at all these stones in this gallbladder, some people will have like one stone, some people will have a whole bunch. But you know, if the bile really isn't flowing through the gallbladder really well, there could be a bunch of stones down here that are just kind of stuck in some gook and they're not really causing any trouble. So then maybe a person's bile will start to flow better and that will allow a stone to move around and then get stuck in a duct and they have a gallbladder attack. And they're like, oh man, taking steps to improve my bile flow gives me gallbladder attacks. But that's not really how it happened. It happened just because those gallstones were starting to move around and one got into a duct. But if a person doesn't take steps to improve that bile flow, then is this gonna get any better? I don't see how it could. It seems like it would just continue to concentrate into more stones or bigger stones and eventually it's going to be blocked up and somebody's gonna have to yank it out and throw it in the trash. But you can see how for that individual that could really create some symptom relief. But if a person's gonna remove all the dietary fat and the gallbladder's already not getting triggered from a lack of stomach acid and now they're not gonna bring in enough fat in to trigger the gallbladder, 
it's just going to continue to concentrate there and eventually create a lot of trouble. So we like to see people take steps to maybe not only dissolve those stones, but also get this bile flowing correctly because we find that it's almost impossible to dissolve those stones at all unless there's movement there, unless there's movement of that bile flowing through the gallbladder correctly to allow those stones to dissolve, to stop that over concentration action and allow some movement in there. So one thing we hear a lot about is an herbal supplement called Chanka Piedra and it's also called Hemi Bemi Bimalayer and it's also called Bumiama Lucky or something like that or Hemi Bemi Bimalayer, just stone breaker. But this is very popular to help dissolve gallstones and kidney stones. It seems to be used more for kidney stones but we see a lot of people using it from gallstones as well and, and I'll put some links in the description below. We also hear a lot of people who like the idea of using malic acid to help melt down those stones and malic acid is found in apples. That's not me telling you to eat a bushel of apples at a time. That's a lot of, of sugar to take in. But malic acid also seems to be very important and useful when it comes to melting down gallstones and trying to get them to move through a, a little bit easier. But the most important part, if you think you're gonna try to reduce some gallstones or allow them to dissolve a little bit and maybe move through at a smaller size, then improving the bile flow is the most important aspect of that. Trying to thin out this bile so that it will flow correctly and that can include removing some problems that might be thickening it up and maybe using some supplements or uh, choices that might thin that bile out and help it to flow correctly. We also hear a lot from people using things like coffee enemas or coffee suppositories and these don't really thin out the bile but they seem to have the ability to dilate that biliary pathway and help things move through a little bit. So if a person took some steps to thin out the bile so it could flow better and then also dilated that pathway, that increases the chance of things being able to move through and maybe even a stone moving through a little bit easier. So if the long-term goal is to really save the gallbladder and improve the actual thing that's causing the pain or the attacks, then some fat is, needs to be included to stimulate this gallbladder to go, but a person might wanna take these other steps first to kinda of get that in motion before you start putting more fat in or the fat's just going to create some kind of gallbladder attack. You know, you really have to look at what you're trying to do. But maybe a person wants to take some of these steps and I don't have a specific amount of time that you should do that before you start introducing fat into the diet again. That's gonna vary greatly from person to person. It might also depend on how much stomach acid a person is making. Is that available at all to trigger the gallbladder as well? If you really wanna understand where your digestion is, my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, kinda of walk you through figuring out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly and steps you can take to improve those situations. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below where you can get the whole thing totally for free and then you can just jump to chapters three and four to kind of walk you through that process. But since it seems like the most important aspect is to improve bile and get that at least flowing and moving a little bit better first, then right now you can jump over and check out our video on five steps to improve bile flow and that'll give you some insights on things that you can do to improve that situation. I can't wait to hear about your results.